Next to present in the Sick Kids historical series is Dr. Barbara Depina Cardoso. I have kept the original introduction, as I just love it, but I thought I would mention that Barbara has since returned to the Freeman Hospital in the UK. At the end of her presentation, there is an amazing 10 minutes of insight and discussion from Dr. Benson, Dr. Mattal and Dr. Dipshand, which I truly hope everyone enjoys as much as we did. Thank you very much for presenting, Barbara. Start. So good morning, everybody. Today, Barbara Dacosa is going to um, present. She received her medical degree from the University of Coimbra in Portugal. She then completed her pediatric cardiology residency at the Hospital de Santa Marta in Lisbon. She then came to the UK, where she landed in Newcastle upon Tyne and trained in pediatric intensive care, heart failure, and cardiac transplant at the Freeman Hospital. She is completing her subspecialty training here in heart function and transplantation at Sick Kids this year. Her main interests are cats, yoga and independent cinema, and she's developed a new love for Tim Horton's latte since she's been in Canada. I can probably speak for everyone when I say she's been a joy to work with over the past nine months. And personally, I just wish I'd known and worked with her in non-COVID times, but I'm sure I haven't seen the last of Barbara. So thank you very much for presenting today, Barbara. And take it away. Thank you so much. That was such a sweet introduction. Thank you. Uh, please let me know if you see my slides and uh, please let me know if they disappear at a certain point. Uh, can they I look fine. Perfect. Right. So thank you so much for the introduction, Alison. Uh, I've been uh, asked to take a look at transplantation from the historical perspective. And uh, as we all know, it's not possible to talk about transplant without talking about heart failure. So I'm going to touch on both aspects of the question. I hope you enjoy this as much as I do. So the cardinal symptoms of heart failure, uh, the SNEA, Anazarka and cachexia, have been well recognized since antiquity. But it was not until the 17th century when uh, William Harvey uh, definitively identified the heart as an organ that pumped blood rather than generating heat, that the heart could begin to be understood as a source of dyspnea, edema and wasting. Nearing a century after Harvey, uh, Albertini made the connection between cardiac maladies and both pulmonary and visceral edema, and thus was the first to describe the clinical picture of congestive heart failure. William Withering, uh, who was a British physician, noticed that a person with dropsy uh, improved remarkably after taking a traditional herbal, uh, herbal remedy. Uh, he became famous for recognizing that the active ingredient in the mixture came from the foxglove plant uh, and the active ingredient is now known as the dioxin, uh, after the plant's scientific name. Uh, in 1785, he published an account of the foxglove and some of its medical uses, uh, which contained reports on clinical trials and notes on digitalis effects and toxicity. And we've been using it uh, to treat heart failure since. As far as we know, there is no mention to heart failure in infancy or childhood until the late 18th century. Pediatric textbooks uh, from the late 1890s include chapters on heart disease that focus on the most common childhood cardiac conditions of the time, uh, which were infectious in nature, including rheumatic fever, uh, endocarditis and pericarditis. And this is a description of uh, heart failure in the terms of the time. And it says, uh, in children, the heart swells rapidly enlarges and the ventricular cavities dilate. And then there follows a contracted leaden consolidation of the bases of the lungs, which is neither simple collapse nor simple edema nor simple pneumonia, but probably something of all of these and which is an excessively dangerous condition because it is an indication of a sorely stricken heart. So heart failure being described as uh, we know it uh, with dilated cardiomyopathy, pulmonary congestion. A decade later, in the early 1900s, uh, hundreds, the history of cardiac transplantation begins with the work of Alexis Carell, uh, which is shown here in Time magazine. He was born and trained in Lyon in France and moved to the United States in uh, 1904 to work at the University of Chicago. 
Um, he, uh, after performing pioneering work in the field of vascular uh, anastomotic techniques, uh, he uh, and Guthrie in 1905 performed the first heterotopic transplant of the heart of a smaller dog uh, into the neck of a larger one. Uh, he went on to uh, win the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology in 1912. Systematic study of heart failure in children began uh, in earnest in the mid-20th century, uh, where the most common cause of pediatric heart failure remained rheumatic fever. And in the picture we see uh, this device, uh, which was used to nurse uh, infants in an upright position uh, for the ones with uh, this knee. Uh, In 1937, a Russian physician called Demikov designed and implemented the first cardiac assist device in a dog. Demikov surmised from Karel's prior work, as well as, as his own experience, uh, that the transplanted heart could function to support the circulation only if it was implanted into the thorax. And around the same time, at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, the novel concept that congenital heart disease uh, disproportionately caused heart failure in infancy began to uh, gain currency uh, with the groundbreaking work of Dr. Uh, Helen Tosig, uh, Dr. Alfred Blaylock and Vivian Thomas, um, who uh, completely revolutionized the treatment of the blue babies and were the founders of pediatric cardiology as we know it. Following the introduction of uh, the pump oxygenator by Gibbon, an American surgeon working in Pennsylvania Hospital in 1953, uh, cardiac surgery become, uh, became a burdening field and the move towards clinical cardiac transplantation began to pick up pace. And then uh, as further experimentation in the mid 60s led to a better understanding of the importance of immunosuppression and sustaining transplant graft survival, the situation became ripe to entertain undertaking the first human uh, heart allo transplant. Uh, this happened with, uh, as we all know, with Christian Barnard in Cape Town, in South Africa, uh, who is credited to uh, achieving this milestone in December 3rd, 1967. Uh, and the recipient unfortunately died of pneumonia 18 days following his transplant. So that's um, Mr. Uh, Washkansky, the transplanted patient that received a heart from a, a younger lady that had died uh, in a traffic accident. Just three days following Barnard's landmark achievement, uh, Kandrovitz performed the first pediatric heart transplant uh, in a three-week-old uh, child with Epstein's anomaly and pulmonary atresia. Uh, at the initiation of transplant, both the donor and the recipient were immersed in iced water to achieve topical cooling, and this can be seen in these pictures on the right side. Uh, the operation was performed at uh, Maimonides Hospital, Brooklyn, New York, uh, but the patient survived only six hours. In the years following the achievements of Barnard and Kantrovitz, uh, approximately 100 heart transplants were performed worldwide uh, with mean survival of just under one month, um, as the majority of deaths were from acute allograft rejection and because the available therapies were limited, enthusiasm for heart transplants um, wanes a little bit. Uh, however, um, another landmark event in the 1970s uh, was um, achieved with the isolation with the fungal extract uh, with potent immunosuppressive properties that gave way to the discovery of cyclosporin, uh, which improved post-transplant outcomes and fused uh, renewed interest in this technique. From the 1970s to 1990s, 
a heterotopic heart transplantation was performed in patients in whom uh, orthotopic transplantation was likely to fail due to high TPGs, donor recipient size mismatches, and a risk of um, rejection. Uh, the anastomoses were complex and the donor pulmonary artery was anastomosed to the recipient PA by means of a Dacron graft and the donor's aorta anastomose to the recipient's aorta. Um, the pulmonary and systemic venous returns uh, were an anastomosed also to the donor's heart. Um, and uh, recently, uh, it has been reported a case of a man who survived for 25 years with this kind of circulation, and he was operated at Texas Heart Institute in Houston and survived to get a orthotopic uh, heart transplant after this. So he has in total three hearts in his life. Leonard Bailey took center stage in the mid uh, 1980s as he pioneered neonatal cardiac transplants by implanting the heart of a baboon into a 12 day old child with aortic and mitral atresia. Bailey Fay, uh, who was a child and uh, who received the, uh, the xeno transplant, survived for less than uh, three weeks. Uh, but I thought it was worth mentioning because it was completely revolutionary at the time. The first successful pediatric heart transplant is disputed among several centers, uh, namely uh, Stanford, Columbia, New York, and uh, Great Ormond Street in um, uh, London, uh, all in 1984. And this is a picture of Eric Rose performing the, the, one of the first successful pediatric heart transplants in New York. Coming to the 2000s, uh, we've seen uh, the first paracorporeal pulsatile left ventricular assist device being implanted in a child. This uh, happened in Berlin with the X-Core Berlin Heart that we all know and love. So another uh, landmark uh, situation was the publishing in 2001 uh, of the um, this paper on ABO incompatible heart transplantation in infants uh, by Dr. Laurie West and Dr. Deepshand from uh, the Hospital of for Sick Children. Uh, and uh, it was the first report uh, of a cohort of 10 infants with ABO incompatible heart transplants uh, that were performed here uh, from 1996 to 2000. Uh, and uh, this has uh, opened the door uh, for this uh, kind of transplant uh, and um, is a very, very important um, achievement in uh, circumventing donor graft scarcity in our population. Recently, and thanks to advancements in ex vivo organ perfusion, perfusion platforms, it has been possible to explore the avenue of DCV uh, hearts, which are donation after cardiac death uh, grafts, uh, which promises to increase the graft donor pool for our patients. The transplantation field has always been a very exciting, fast moving field, and the current area is no exception. So what will the future bring for cardiac transplantation? I think, um, the use of uh, DCD donors and the uh, generalization of ex vivo perfusion, uh, perfusion platforms will uh, hopefully help circumventing donor graft scarcity. So this is a very important um, innovation. In parallel, new pharmacotherapy targets are being developed with uh, advances in the field of pharmacogenomics, immunobiology, and uh, induction of tolerance uh, is also being explored. And lastly, uh, recipients will be able to be bridged to transplant with increasingly smaller ventricular cyst devices uh, and uh, gene expression profiling and donor fraction cell-free DNA will allow for less invasive forms of rejection monitoring. So I'll leave you uh, with this quote from Vladimir Demikov, one of the precursors of ventricular cyst devices. 
Uh, and he said that uh, for thousands of years, the heart has symbolized the center of man's immortal soul. Therefore, those who seek to tackle the mysteries in clinical um, practice uh, require a great intellectual and moral courage. And I totally agree with this. Uh, and in reviewing this history, I feel very grateful and humbled to be able to work in this area and to be able to be standing on the shoulders of all these, these giants that preceded me. I'll leave you with a suggestion um, of a documentary uh, that I watched yesterday. Very, very interesting. Uh, it's called Hidden Heart, and it's the story of the first heart transplant uh, with Christian Barnard. And another character that unfortunately is not very well known, very much like uh, Vivian um, Thomas, uh, Hamilton Naki, who was a black man uh, who was uh, Barnard's uh, right hand and because of apartheid and because of him being black didn't get the protagonism that he deserved. So he's being um, talked about in this film as well. I very much recommend. And this is all. I think I'm in time still. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Barbara. That was fantastic. I was hoping that um, we could spend five minutes just talking or gaining insight from those who were around sick kids at the time of the first ABO incompatible transplant. Um, if anyone has any comments, Dr. Dipchand, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what insight to say other than uh, we all stood in the operating room uh, quite nervous as to what was going to happen when we took off the cross clamp and it obviously went remarkably well. It definitely was, um, you know, an honor to be part of and it was, uh, as you've heard from Barbara, it's definitely changed the field from a transplant perspective. Does anyone have any questions or comments? That was excellent, Barbara. Thank you very much. Thank you so well, much. Well, actually, actually the, the very first ABO mismatch that was done on purpose at the hospital, I think was in 93. Um, John Coles, Carl Cadella and I were involved with the heart transplant program at, in, in its inception. Now, Carl Cadella was, uh, he's a kidney transplant doctor and he ran the immunosuppression program for the adult program at the Toronto Western, which is where it was originally before it moved to TGH. And, uh, we had a, a child with a dilated cardiomyopathy. She was four years old and on ECMO and not doing very well. And John and I were sort of, you know, what could we do for this child? And we discussed uh, an ABO mismatch with Carl and he encouraged us to do it, um, noting that um, uh, the experience in the kidney, uh, ABO mismatch in the liver, was not as dismal as one would think. And there had been a couple of cardiac ABO mismatches done in adults by mistake. Uh, the outcomes were sort of variable. So it was actually that, that child, she was four at the time, that, um, that John and I and Carl um, uh, did the transplant. She actually did well. And it was that case that uh, prompted us to encourage Lori when she came um, to run the transplant program and her expertise in um, immunology to focus in on uh, uh, infants and uh, uh, newborns for uh, transplant with ABO mismatch and that, that it might be a little safer undertaking. So that, so there's always a story behind a story, um, but uh, uh, all the people on that, that New England Journal paper had something to do with uh, encouraging those uh, uh, cases. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Benson. It's, uh, it's fantastic. I have to say the you know the the it may come out it was in the documentary maybe even the Christian Bernard being the first surgeon to do the transplant and that was a real race for who would do the first human transplant because there were at least three groups surgical groups in the U.S. that were really wanting to be the first ones. And I think they were shocked and surprised that some 
lesser known surgeon from South Africa who got that first claim to fame. So there's always a lot of drama that surrounds these things that come out first. Absolutely, because uh, it's this person that is going to go down in history. And actually, one of the centers that uh, was in the race was Houston, where uh, Barnard had been a fellow not long ago. He had spent two years in in Texas and um, had actually gained his PhD from there. And uh, returning to South Africa, actually, the, the cardiopulmonary bypass machine was provided by Texas. So they gave them the the bypass machine that uh, in the end enabled them to to um, proceed with the transplant. If anyone ever has the opportunity to go there, there's a very nice um, kind of little museum that they put together of this at, at the hospital with a lot of the original story and equipment um, in Cape Town. And there's also this one interesting thing about Leonard Bailey, who did the first baboon transplant, right? The Xeno transplantation, uh, when I think he was asked about whether it was, why didn't he use something like a chimpanzee or something that's a primate that's closer to humans? He actually said, because he didn't believe in evolution. So that was a quite an ironic kind of, uh, I guess, statement for someone who actually did xenotransplantation. It's interesting you, you talk about Len Bailey. Now, Len Bailey was a, a, a fellow in cardiac surgery here with George Trussler and Bill Williams. And uh, when you speak to Len about w why he was able to push forward with, with uh, new, newborn transplantation, he tells a story, or he told a story, that uh, um, they were discussing at cath rounds, or the morning rounds here at SickKids, uh, uh, the management of a patient with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And Dick Rowe was in the room, and uh, Len Bailey, who was at the back of the room because he was just a cardio cardiac surgical fellow, uh, said, well, why don't you think about transplanting? And everybody in the room sort of hummed and hauled and laughed. And Dick said, you know, that's really not a very bad idea. And uh, it was the, the encouragement from that statement from Dr. Rowe um, uh, to Len, who said, well, you know, maybe I will pursue this. Uh, so there, as I said before, there's always a story behind a story. Absolutely, that's fascinating. And I think uh, just to finish the remarks, I think um, the evolution and uh, the evolution of transplant has uh, a lot to do with ethical questions as well. And the concept of uh, brain death um death uh, was very was not established before and actually it was very important to establish this concept to actually move forward uh, and maybe this was one of the reasons why uh, the first transplant actually occurred in south africa and it was interesting and it's in the documentary as well that the first um, transplant so this this first transplant that i mentioned and then because of this enthusiasm, uh, Dr. Barnard performed another transplant very shortly afterwards, uh, a couple of months afterwards, that the identities of the donors were completely exposed to the media, uh, uh, which uh, uh, afterwards uh, stopped happening. Uh, but uh, for the first two, the, the identities of the, the donors and even their pictures were um, came out in the press. Yeah, it's very interesting. Well, thank you, Barbara. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow.